Hello, my name is Gregory Engel. I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist with Silicon Valley Cardiology, and I'm here in the cath lab at Sequoia Hospital, and I'm here to talk to you about atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is actually the most common arrhythmia we see in the world. It's estimated that nearly three million patients in the United States alone have atrial fibrillation. By age 75, about 10% of the population will have atrial fibrillation. Some people develop it at much younger ages, more people develop it at older ages. Clearly, age is related, but there's a lot of other things that lead to atrial fibrillation and increase your risk of having it. There's a lot of different risk factors. Age, as I mentioned, is probably the primary risk factor. Hypertension, which is one of the more common diseases in the world, is one of the main risk factors. Being overweight can be a risk factor. Having other vascular disease can be a risk factor drinking a lot of alcohol, thyroid disease, and anything that causes structural changes in the heart, heart valve problems or other structural heart disease, can directly lead to atrial fibrillation. In some patients, even caffeine can be a contributing factor. Atrial fibrillation is broken down into three varieties. The first type is paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. This is atrial fibrillation that comes and goes, starts and stops on its own. The next type is persistent atrial fibrillation. Once it starts, it tends to continue, usually for at least a week, if not longer, unless we intervene. The third type is what's called long-standing persistent or chronic atrial fibrillation, where it continues for extended periods of time and people are often in it for years or essentially their lifetime. Each of these types of atrial fibrillation has slightly different treatment approaches and the more advanced the atrial fibrillation is, the more persistent it is, the harder it is to treat but all three types can be treated. The symptoms of atrial fibrillation are quite variable. Some patients have almost no symptoms at all, and some people are completely asymptomatic, feeling nothing. Most patients, however, do have some symptoms. Those symptoms can be relatively benign, such as minor palpitations, feeling extra heartbeats, or feeling your heart racing. Some people become short of breath, others have chest pain. Some people become lightheaded, dizzy, Others just have a general sense of fatigue or malaise, or just feel they can't exercise quite as much as they used to. Others have much more significant symptoms. They become very short of breath. They can even have swelling or signs of what we call congestive heart failure, and there can even be weakening of the heart in patients who have atrial fibrillation, especially those patients where the atrial fibrillation goes fast for an extended period of time. So there's a wide range of symptoms, and each patient's gonna fall in a different part of this range and it may also change over time. There are multiple risks associated with having atrial fibrillation. Some of the effects of atrial fibrillation are symptoms and how patients feel. Sometimes atrial fibrillation causes the heart to weaken. The most important risk of atrial fibrillation is the risk of stroke. Because the upper chamber of the heart, the atrium, is going so fast, blood tends to pool, and when blood pools, it can form blood clots. And the number one risk we worry about is one of those blood clots going to the brain possibly somewhere else in the body, but if it goes to the brain, it's gonna cause a stroke. There are a number of risk factors that determine the likelihood of each patient having a stroke. Having a history of high blood pressure is one of those factors. Having a prior stroke is obviously a major risk factor, or even what we call a TIA, a transient ischemic attack, which is a stroke-like event that happens very briefly, but goes away. Having a history of diabetes, or having weakening of the heart, or what we call congestive heart failure, is also a risk factor Women also tend to have a slightly higher risk than men. And another important risk factor is age. The older you are, the higher the risk. Age 65 being a minor cutoff and being over age 75 a more important cutoff to increase your risk. When we think of treating atrial fibrillation, we break it down into three parts. Anticoagulation to treat stroke is the number one thing we need to think about. Number two is rate control, controlling how fast the heart goes. And number three is rhythm control, trying to get a patient out of atrial fibrillation. The most important part of treating atrial fibrillation is that we will individualize it for each and every patient. Regardless of whether you're a candidate for ablation or what your options are, we're gonna work hard to find a solution that's best for you to make you feel better and improve your quality of life. We look at each individual patient and add up their risk factors to determine how important and what type of anticoagulation medications are needed. The least that's normally used is aspirin. Coumadin, or warfarin, has been the blood thinner that's been traditionally used to treat patients and help prevent strokes. It's highly effective, but unfortunately difficult to manage. 
multiple blood tests are required, and different foods you eat and different diet can affect the levels, and those need to be followed carefully. The newer alternatives to Coumadin include Pradaxa, Xarelto, and a very recently approved drug, Eliquis. These fortunately provide us a lot of good options to Coumadin where you don't have to have regular blood checks and they can be very effective for full anticoagulation without having to worry about diet and other drug interactions. Rate control is an important aspect of treatment of atrial fibrillation. A lot of the symptoms related to atrial fibrillation are due to the rapid heart rate it causes. We use a number of different medications to try to control that. It's individualized to each patient. Calcium channel blockers and beta blockers, which are traditional blood pressure pills, are very effective at slowing the heart rate. Sometimes we use other medications, such as digoxin, to help control the heart rate as well. The key in controlling that heart rate is improving the symptoms and helping prevent possible stress on the heart that could lead to weakening of the heart as well. Rhythm control is the process of keeping a patient out of atrial fibrillation and preventing them from going back into it. Obviously, if we can keep you out of AFib, you're not going to have all the side effects associated with it. We can also reduce the risks associated with AFib by preventing it from happening. There are multiple ways of approaching this. What is usually first recommended is medications. There are a number of different medications that can be used. Some of their names include sotalol, flecainide, propafenone, amiodarone, Moltac, Ticacin. Each of these drugs has different effects, different side effects, and different patients for whom they're right for. Unfortunately, some of these drugs have more significant side effects than others, and each patient has to have an individualized approach. The other unfortunate thing about these medications is in the long run, they're not highly effective. Very few of these medications are more than 50% effective even at a year, let alone the long run. So the reality is most patients eventually need something more than medications, but medications can be quite effective for some patients and can provide an interim solution for other patients. If medications don't work or they're not an option for certain patients due to side effects, the next approach to treating atrial fibrillation is to use a procedure to try to stop atrial fibrillation. In the short run, we can use procedures such as cardioversions to stop atrial fib and put people into normal rhythm. This is a procedure in which a patient is very briefly put under anesthesia, just gently put to sleep, and the heart is restarted back into normal rhythm. Similar to what you see on TV with heart paddles, but patients obviously don't jump off the table like they do on television. This is done in a very controlled manner and a very safe and effective procedure at converting someone back to normal rhythm. It has a short-term effect. In some patients, it's effective for longer periods of time. And after you're back in normal rhythm, we can use medications or other procedures to keep it that way. If medications aren't working or they're not an option, the most common procedure to treat atrial fibrillation is something called ablation. Atrial fibrillation is a relatively modern procedure. The best techniques have been developed over about the last 10 years, with the procedure invented only about 20 years ago, which is relatively new in the scheme of medicine. Fortunately, modern technology has allowed us to really advance this field, and in the old days, Medications were our only option, and the concept of curing atrial fibrillation wasn't even part of our vocabulary. But now we can actually cure atrial fibrillation in a number of patients. An ablation procedure involves going inside the body. It's relatively non-invasive in that we go through the groin, the crease in the leg, bring catheters up through the heart without large incisions, just very small holes that heal up nicely, and we can get inside the heart. And an ablation is essentially to burn or to cauterize tissue. And if you can burn or cauterize tissue, you block the conduction of electricity. And if you can isolate out the areas where the atrial fibrillation is coming from, you can prevent AFib from occurring. Most atrial fibrillation is coming from the left atrium and specifically the pulmonary veins, which are four veins that drain blood from the lungs back into the left atrium of the heart. If we can isolate those veins out using ablation, we can cure the majority of atrial fibrillation. Some people have AFib coming from other areas, and there's some additional techniques that are used to try to cure those patients as well. But this is a highly effective and valuable technique that can cure a lot of patients. This is a simplified diagram of your heart. This is the right atrium, this is the right ventricle, this is the left atrium, and this is the left ventricle. These circles here represent the pulmonary veins, which are located in the back of the left atrium. They drain all the blood in from the lungs. Most atrial fibrillation originates in or near the pulmonary veins. The ablation procedure involves going in and essentially burning or cauterizing tissue to block electrical signals. If you can go in 
and you can isolate the veins on both sides using the ablation technique and in some patients, we do additional lines across the top, across the lower portion to isolate the posterior wall. You can cure the majority of atrial fibrillation by knocking out the locations where the AFib comes from and isolating where these triggers are coming from. In some patients, there are other parts of the heart where atrial fibrillation originates, and we also look for those during the procedure. Unfortunately, not everyone has atrial fibrillation ablation as an option, and not everyone is cured by it but there are other options. Some patients end up needing pacemakers and other types of procedures to slow down their AFib even if it continues. There are even surgical options. These are very effective, especially in patients who need surgery for other reasons. If you have a valve problem or something else that needs to be fixed surgically, there are surgical procedures called a maze procedure or modified maze procedures that can be used to treat your atrial fibrillation while the surgeon is in there doing something else. The bottom line and the most important aspect of treating atrial fibrillation is that we individualize our treatment to each patient. Whether you're a candidate for drugs, whether you're a candidate for ablation, we can find a solution for each patient to in some cases cure the atrial fibrillation and in other cases control the symptoms and improve your quality of life.